Hey there. If you are caring for someone with advanced Parkinson's disease, then you know how challenging the later stages of Parkinson's can be emotionally, physically, financially. Um, however, there are some simple ways to make this chapter of Parkinson's easier on you as a caregiver and on your loved one. So today we're going to talk about using some of those simple strategies so you as a caregiver can avoid running yourself and your health into the ground while also ensuring you're doing the absolute most that you possibly can for your loved one. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If this is your first time, please say hi in the comments section. Give this video a thumbs up. Let us know that you're out there watching. Let us know what questions you have about caring for someone with advanced Parkinson's because we are going to do our best today answering your questions. And if we haven't met yet, my name is Sarah King and here at Invigorate, we help you get out of overwhelm and into action by connecting you with the tools and support you need to thrive despite having a Parkinson's diagnosis. And today I'm really excited to bring an amazing guest back on the show. We're continuing our caregiver focused video series by inviting Annie Wallace back onto the show. As I said, she is the Associate Director of Education at the Parkinson's Foundation. She's been on our program before talking about the earlier spectrum of uh, caregiving for Parkinson's, what you should be doing immediately after a Parkinson's diagnosis. And today we're shifting more towards the later edges of Parkinson's, the later stages, and talking about strategies that you can use when we start getting into advanced Parkinson's symptoms. And um, she helps create a number of programs at the Parkinson's Foundation, um, educational materials that have reached literally thousands of those of you diagnosed with Parkinson's. You can give this video a thumbs up if you love the Parkinson's Foundation. Um, she's making great strides for that foundation. And she's going to talk to us specifically about resources that we can use um, for advanced Parkinson's and that the Parkinson's Foundation provides. So I'm going to bring her on here in a second. I want you guys to make sure you stay tuned for the entire thing because any questions you have will be going through the comments um, and answering them at the end. So stay tuned. I see some of you watching and tuning in. Michael's here. Hello, Graham um, Thompson from Scotland. Louise, hello. And hi, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in. Um, I want to remind you that this caregiver focused series um, that's going for the entire month of November, which is Caregiver Awareness Month, all of our interviews and all of the resources that we mention are going to be in a free downloadable PDF book that you can get at invigoratept.com slash caregivers. You can go there, get it, put your information in and get all of this information sent to you. Um, Annie's going to give you a ton of resources. So everything she mentions is going to go in that caregiver kit. Um, if you don't want to take notes, no big deal. Um, I know Annie is also going to give you a ton of resources. So make sure that you have something ready to write down, um, you know, those resources with. But you can get them all in one PDF download if at invigoratept.com slash caregivers with an S. So um, that'll just make it easier on you. You can just pay attention and get the notes um, later. So without further ado, let me bring on one of the most... Um, celebrated guests on our um, show so far. I'm way out of this. Here we go. Okay. So let me bring her on. Hello, Miss Annie. Welcome Hi. back. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yes. We had so many rave reviews of your last um, interview. So many people loved all the information you had to share and everything that the Parkinson's Foundation provides. So thank you for coming back. Yes. And yeah. we are going to shift gears a bit. So we talked a little bit before, and you have a lot of information to share. So maybe we can just start by talking about how someone might know that they have shifted into or their loved one has shifted into an advanced, advanced stage of Parkinson's and what that means for both people involved. So the simple answer for um, what is advanced Parkinson's is when your loved one with Parkinson's is no longer independent. And that can look a lot of different ways. And, and just like Parkinson's, it's uh, people are going to define um, advanced Parkinson's differently um, based on you know what their life looked like before Parkinson's, based on age, based on all these different factors. 
Um, and so as a general rule, if you feel like you are physically caring for your loved one more than you have ever had to do, then um, if you're not already in the advanced Parkinson's stage, you're probably getting close. Um, okay. And one of the key things to keep in mind um, is that as Parkinson's progresses, even if you're sort of before the official advanced Parkinson's uh, stage, uh, you really want to keep thinking about how, um, how you're providing help um, and how much help you need in order to give help to your loved one as their care needs change, you know, and, and as your health changes, because that's, it's, it's ever evolving. Um, and you may go through stages where you need more help and then be able to pull back on that. Um, but I think that's really important to think about before it becomes an issue. Right. And I think um, a lot of people tuning in, there are care partners out there. There are people in every stage. Um, and I know the question comes up a lot. How do you know when it's time to pull that trigger and hire outside help? Um, a lot of people tend to put that off, you know, mm -hmm. tend to delay that um, maybe longer than they should. So how does someone know when they're getting to that point? How is there any like telltale signs that mean it's time to get some help? It's time to expand. Well, the first one that I always want to point out is if you're feeling burnt out, if you're feeling like um, you're feeling more anger and frustration towards your loved one with Parkinson's than you are feeling that love and positivity, it's probably time to, to bring in somebody else to help and help relieve some of that stress, um, whether it's a family member or a friend or a professional caregiver. Um, but it's really important to catch those signs of burnout early uh, because when you lose your ability to care for your loved one um, and, and feel all that empathy and love for them, um, it's, it's tricky to get that back. Um, and in an ideal world, you would prevent that and you would get the help so that you don't have to, uh, to deal with, you know, those feelings and, and how you'll feel about yourself when you're feeling those feelings, which is definitely never fair um, because caregiving takes a whole lot out of you. Um, especially when, as the disease advances. Um, right. And yeah. I was going to say, there's a reminder here for everyone watching that, you know, there's one person with a Parkinson's diagnosis with specific needs. And then the other half of this equation is you as a loved one or a spouse or, you know, a care partner. Um, you also are part of that unit that needs to be, you know, needs a strategy, needs support. And it's not all about, um, you know, giving everything to the person who has the diagnosis, you know, you guys can't function unless there are support for both sides. So um, if you're not feeling supported as a care partner, if you're feeling run down, if you're feeling unhealthy, if you're feeling not supported, then um, it's potentially time to um, recognize that you need that mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, so, the other thing to really keep an eye on is your physical health. Um, if you notice that um, you're having to do regular heavy lifting and it's causing health problems, if you notice that um, the time you're spending caregiving means you're not prioritizing getting to the doctor um, or that you're not eating a nutritious uh, meal every now and then at least, um, if, you're, if there are health consequences to the way that you're giving care to your loved one with Parkinson's, it's time to get some help. Those are some great, great indicators. Um, so tell us a little bit about how someone might go about doing that. They recognize they're not taking care of themselves. They need emotional support, physical support. Um, what are some of the ways to start that process? You know, it obviously with uh, paid caregiving, there is the money aspect. Um, and for a lot of people, the finances are a big barrier. Um, and so if, if you're in that situation, then it is obviously a little more difficult. Um, there are so many resources out in the community, but not nearly as many as we need. And as is true with many social issues, oftentimes people who are sort of middle of the road doing fine, um, but can't add a little extra to get you know paid care, there's not as much assistance available. Um, 
And this is something that is still true. It's an imperfect system, but I would recommend um, connecting with your local area agency on aging. Um, it's a, every county has one, um, probably whatever county you're in um, and your neighboring counties share an agency on aging. And a lot of times they have um, financial need based assistance for, um, for paid caregivers, whether it's um, provided directly through them, um, the caregivers are employed by the area agency, or um, if they're able to give, you know, financial assistance for outside agencies. Um, sometimes your local uh, county aging office, if you have one, also will have caregiver assistance. Um, I'm a big proponent of dialing your local 211 crisis hotline. I'm a former crisis hotline uh, staff, I guess volunteer actually. Um, but if you can dial 211 from any local phone and it will take you to your local um, hotline and they have a whole database that they can search, they can type in keywords and say caregiver financial assistance and anything that is available for you in your zip code will pop up and they can give you the phone number and all the information you need before you call in. Wow, I didn't know about that one. That's a good one. Yes, yeah, it, it's probably 99% of the country is covered. I'm sure there are you know, a few areas here and there. And if you're in one of those areas, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, but that's, that's always a good place to start. And the other that um, I always recommend is connecting with um, the Parkinson's helpline um, 1 800 4 PD info. I have the number written down so I can actually give it to you this time. It's 1 800 473 4636. Um, the Parkinson's Foundation does not give out direct financial assistance, but, um, but we can sort of talk you through different strategies and help you get connected with what's available locally as well. Yeah, that's a great hotline. Um, make sure that you guys take note of that one if you missed it. I know it'll be in the comments or in our caregiver kit. Um, or you can go to the Parkinson's Foundation, which I think is parkinsons.org, um, their website and their numbers at the top. Um, so that's an amazing resource. How about how, kind of lassoing the power of your friends and your family? Yes, yes. What yes. strategies do you have there? So I'm actually going to be talking um, a little more about this at our upcoming Caregiver Summit, which is available online and in person across the country, December 1st. Um, you can learn more about that at parkinson.org slash summit. Um, but the key is really to think about who in your life may possibly be available to help in some way. Um, don't, don't try and narrow it down to who can do this exact thing for me. Think about what skills and what availability the people around you have and see if that can fit in with your needs. And it doesn't always have to be... Um, sort of a one-for-one one direct uh, obvious option. It may be, you know, that you opt to have your loved one with Parkinson's go to church with, you know, your neighbor uh, one Sunday morning a week so that you have a couple hours to yourself. Um, you know, it, it can look very different, um, but thinking about people who you may not be comfortable asking even, you know, like I said, your neighbors, asking your kids, um, asking people at your church or house of worship, worship. Um, and then just asking the question, asking, Hey, can you do this specific thing on this specific day? Um, cause when you're specific and if it's a reasonable ask and people are able to, they typically will, um, start small. Um, because even those small little, breaks that can allow you to go to the doctor or can allow you to go to the grocery store in peace or, you know, go do a yoga class so that you can find your center, whatever it is. Um, those things make a huge difference. That's amazing. And um, one thing that I have known a few of my clients to use that I think was recommended at some point by um, the Michael J. Fox Foundation is a website called Lots a helping hands. Have you heard of it? I think I have. I was I, I was looking at a couple different um, websites like that for my um, little presentation at the summit, and I think that was one of the ones I came across. 
Okay, I think um, I'm gonna put it on the screen just cause it's spelled a little strange, but it's, um, I think it's got a website and maybe possibly an app too, but mm -hmm. you can kind of uh, invite your friends and your family into it and they can kind of collaborate on meals or errands or appointments or whatnot. Um, and it's kind of a good way to kind of lasso the community. And I agree with you being specific and saying, you know, I, I go to yoga, mine is Sunday nights, not that I have someone with advanced Parkinson's, but if it were me, I would say, you know, can we do dinner together and then I can go to yoga or something and we can kind of work together. But being specific on finding those times and those those tasks is really, really successful from what I've understood from my yeah, um, yeah. clients. The other really simple thing that you can do, um, since you all are watching this on Facebook, I guess not all, some of you are on YouTube, um, make a Facebook group of people local to you who may be able to step up and, and help if a situation comes up um, so that you can just send out to the group, hey, um, we're having a rough day. I wasn't able to get to the grocery store. Can somebody bring dinner by tonight? Um, and then everyone who's in that designated group, it's a, you can make it closed so that people who aren't invited in there can't see it, but they can see that. And, and hopefully someone will come in and say, hey, yeah, I've got you. I've, you know, I'll be over at six. Mm hmm. Yeah. And what would you say to people? Because I feel like we hear a, a lot of people who especially tune in online. This might be their one place where they feel like they do have that support. Um, what recommendations would you have for someone who would say, I'm doing this all on my own. It's my mom or my dad or my husband or my wife. And it's just me and I don't have anyone else to reach out to. What do you have to, for them? Well, I may not have um, the the true, you know, the the big problem solver where, oh, just do this. And then suddenly there will be people who can help you, who can do all these things. Um, it's not quite that simple, but I would recommend finding a local support group. Um, because even if those aren't people who are going to be able to, you know, drop by and uh, and bring dinner on a tough day, they will be people who you can call and, you know, commiserate with. Um, and, and it may become a group that can meet some of those needs, um, that, that folks who have family or friends or, um, you know, local house of worship who is filling that role. Um, you know, it's, it's not uncommon for people to say that. I also tend to challenge that, um, say there's really no one, you know, you, you couldn't talk to your neighbor about, um, uh, mowing your lawn when they mow theirs, you couldn't you know, talk to somebody in Sunday school and see if they would be willing to, you know, do X, Y, Z. Um, a lot of times we, we say, oh, I can't do this. I can't ask this of people. And it's a combination of pride and anxiety um, and not wanting to admit to people who maybe we haven't let in in that way that we do need this kind of help and not wanting to admit it to ourselves. Um, so I would challenge anyone who's saying that to really think if there are people who could become that kind of friend, that kind of lifeline, even if they hadn't been in the past. That's great advice. Yeah. And I think a lot of times that making yourself vulnerable to ask, especially if they're people that you don't feel like, sh quote unquote, you know, should have to help friends or family. But mm -hmm. there are a lot of really nice strangers out here or people who are really wanting to help you. So mm -hmm. you're you're never alone. Um, and don't and be afraid to say yes when someone offers to help. Even if it isn't something you had been specifically thinking, oh, I need to ask somebody for this. If someone offers and it's something that is even mildly helpful, start saying yes. Because if you get them in the habit of helping, then when you do have something to ask, you know, you can go to them. Yeah, definitely. And I'm going to put up um, our link. We have for any of you who are feeling like you're doing this on your own. Um, actually, Lauren's watching. She can put this in the comments. Um, we have a online, a free online community called the Invigorated Community that everyone's welcome to join. Um, it's a virtual community, so they might not be the people sitting next to you, you know, in the house next door or next to you on the um, pew at Sunday service, but you can always go in there and say that you're struggling with something or, um, you know, ask for help. We constantly have people posting in there just asking for prayers or, um, you know, for resources or 
you know, advice, insight. So we, there's always that option. You guys are welcome to join. Um, and I'll have Lauren put it in the comments, a link to, it's called the Invigorated Community. It's a private Facebook group here on Facebook um, that you're welcome to join as well. So you never have to do it alone. Annie and I are here for you. Um, you know, we can help as much as we can. So let's transition from um, kind of friends and family help to, we talked a lot about lassoing your healthcare team. So those people who are your physicians, your physical therapists, your OTs, how can someone, you know, by the time they're going or they have advanced Parkinson's, by the time you're kind of grappling with the later stages of Parkinson's, you have a lot of healthcare providers, most likely on board. Um, so how can someone lasso the power of that group to make your life a, a bit easier as a caregiver or someone with Parkinson's? So it's important to think about um, sort of who can come in and help you find the tricks of the trade, the tricks and tips that can make dealing with advanced Parkinson's a little easier. Um, occupational therapists are um, usually my, my first suggestion there. They are the pros at helping you find tools that can help. Um, so an occupational therapist, um, you know, if you say I'm having trouble getting my loved one in and out of bed, um, not only can they, like a physical therapist, show you techniques on um, ways to make it easier on your loved one and on you know your own back and on yourself. Um, they may have um, an assistive device that can be used. They may be able to suggest something simple like, oh, try getting silk sheets instead of you know regular old cotton so that it's smoother um, and your loved one is less likely to stick. Um, so they are, um, if you can find an occupational therapist who will come into the home and do a home assessment, a lot of times they can point out things that you didn't even realize were solvable problems in your home. Um, and that can make a huge difference. Um, physical therapy, they're the other ones that I always um, make sure to call out. Um, like I said, um, helping with techniques, with um, lifting and transferring is huge. Because if you give yourself a, a neck or a back or a knee injury from lifting your loved one because of poor form, that can have a huge consequence. And um, I know in my personal experience, whenever I injure myself doing something, I'll injure myself doing it again. Um, I'm it's something of a runner, not much. Um, but I have bad ankles because I hurt my ankles once. And once you hurt your joints, they're weakened even after they heal. So you really want to be proactive about this and, and see a physical therapist as soon as, um, as soon as you're starting to do some of those lifting and transferring um, situations so that you can establish healthy practices in doing so. And I can speak from very um, intense experience that a gait belt and mm -hmm. keeping your bum low whenever you try and help someone out of a chair will save your back and also save their safety. That's another, that's the other half of that is when you right. learn to do it right, you're keeping the person that you're safe. helping. Yeah. yeah. More comfortable. You're not yanking on their shoulders. You're not, you know, hurting them when you transfer them. There's a way to kind of comfortably make the transition a lot easier. And, um, it's really, really important when, especially when you might be doing those transfers three, four, 17 times a day. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The other thing I really wanted to make sure I called out while we were chatting today um, was palliative care. Um, palliative care is not all that common in the United States. Um, a lot of people, when they hear palliative care, assume that people are talking about hospice and they're related. They're similar, but they're different. Um, so I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about that. Um, I'd be interested if anybody comments on this, um, if uh, if you guys have heard about utilizing palliative care before you're at the hospice stage, because most people haven't, and even in Parkinson's, it's not talked about enough. Um, but palliative care is really just working with a team of experts who provide symptom and pain management along with spiritual care and medical support to people with serious illnesses. Um, and with Parkinson's being such a chronic disease with no cure, it's a perfect fit for palliative care. Um, and we're starting to see more palliative care clinics pop up that have um, connection to Parkinson's disease. We actually just um, 
had a really fabulous podcast go up um, interviewing Dr. Kluger out in Colorado, who's the director of their neurology and supportive care clinic. Um, he, he said they started using the phrase supportive care as opposed to palliative care, um, just because people heard palliative care and thought hospice, even though they're not the same. Um, so you can check that out here, what it looks like there. Um, you can always get all our podcast stuff at parkinson.org slash podcast. Um, we also actually tomorrow have an expert briefing webinar available um, on advanced Parkinson's and palliative care. Um, so if you go to parkinson.org slash EB, you can join in on that live tomorrow. Oh gosh, at I think 1 Eastern, 1 PM. Um, but if you miss it tomorrow or if you're watching this and it's not live, um, that'll be archived within a couple days. So you can just go on the website and watch it at your leisure. Um, and for those of you who are watching later, um, you know, today is November 19th. So the date of that webinar would be November 20th, 2018. Yes. Um, just in case someone's watching and needs to locate that. And I put the link on our screen. So that can be a really great webinar for you guys to check out. Go ahead, Annie. Yes, yes. Um, and I just want to give a little call out to what I mentioned with spiritual care. Um, it's really important to know that when we talk about spiritual care and spirituality in the social services world, that that is individualized to you. So if you're going and seeing, uh, you know, doing palliative care and, and you're someone who is not religious, who is not, uh, you know, who's not whatever, who has never identified themselves as spiritual, um, it'll be tailored to what is relevant to you. So it'll be, it, that may look like, um, you know, looking at the connections to loved ones that you have and the, the, you know, making sure that you express your gratitude to your loved ones. It may, it could look a million different ways, but the one thing you can know is that it's going to be tailored to um, your needs and your beliefs. That's great news. And honestly, I'm not sure how much I recognize the difference between palliative care versus, um, you know, kind of end of life hospice type of thing. Um, so how would someone go about talking to their healthcare provider? Is that something you talk about with your movement disorder specialist? Who do you, how do you start that process? Yes. So I would definitely say it's something worth bringing up to your movement disorder specialist. It may or may not be something that's on their radar. Um, and if, <laughs> if you get hit with a blank stare or if you get hit with, well, you don't need to be on hospice yet. Um, I would recommend seeing if um, your movement disorder specialist has a social worker on staff. Um, they may be more likely to help you um, or to be able to help you find any local palliative care. Um, palliative care is tricky because sometimes it's covered by insurance. Sometimes it's not. Um, it, you know, it's still uh, sort of being developed as a standard in uh, health care um, and still has a lot of, a lot of uh, room to grow there. Um, and there may not be, you know, a Parkinson specific palliative care option close to you, but, um, you know, a good clinic social worker should be able to find you something uh, similar that is, falls in the realm of palliative care uh, that's local to you. And then the other resource is always to call the helpline and see if they can um, help you get connected with something. Awesome. Yeah, sounds like that webinar will be really, really helpful for people who are wanting to pursue that route. Um, so something I wanted to, we are getting a couple questions. I see Monique asked, um, and this might be for later, but we could address it now. Monique asked, how would you suggest picking someone up after they fall? So I'm happy to chime in too, but as far as resources or, um, you know, a lot of my clients, they just call the fire department. Mm -hmm. um, who has to come and pick you up off the ground. But um, do you have any other, do you have any other strategies or suggestions for getting people up off the floor? So um, I am not going to speak specifically to the mechanics of it since I am a social mm -hmm. worker and not a physical therapist, but I will mm -hmm. tell you, um, I have in my notes um, to tell you guys all about um, some videos that are available on parkinson.org. So if you go to parkinson.org slash movement and falls, You'll find videos on assisting with standing and sitting, how to address major changes to mobility, and how to help someone get up from a fall. Um, so it is, is something it, 
the address. And Is it's it movement and falls without a gap. I'm trying to put yes, that link no here. gap, no gap. Okay, up it goes. Go ahead. Yes. So um, that's available, and that's a great place to start um, before you do a one-on-one -on -one and practice it with a physical therapist before the fall happens. Um, and the other piece I would say is if you haven't practiced it, if you haven't talked to a physical therapist about how to do it, that calling the fire department is probably a smart um, thing to do instead. Because even with a minor fall, you don't know what kind of damage was done. You don't know if um, you know any bones were fractured. You don't know if um, if there was any, you know, if they hit their head the wrong way, it's always good to be checked out um, if at all possible. Yep, and the fire department does not mind coming to help you. Um, that's what they are paid for, you know, to help people who are in need. And I would agree, you know, it depends on the person's um, physical ability that you're trying to pick up. Can they help you at all? Your physical ability, you know, there are a lot of proper forms of getting someone up off the floor that require a really deep squat, strong hips, and a strong core. And that's most of the time why you have a fire department. Um, <laughs> you know, I have one strategy that's completely off the wall, but that I've actually seen a client do who had a lot of falls um, just to in increase their comfort. For some reason, they would um, lay out an air mattress that was completely deflated on the ground and help them kind of roll onto it. They'd inflate the air mattress huh. to be one of the, you know, one of the higher ones, um, not the like low kind of camping one, but one of the higher like king size deluxe. And it would kind of raise them to the point where they were high enough off of the ground that they could kind of be assisted to a sitting position and then um, transition to a wheelchair or whatnot. So that's um, so creative. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So assuming they haven't broken anything or hit in their head or whatnot, but that might be um, something to explore. So mm -hmm. that's neither here nor there. Um, okay. That's actually really, really good help. If you guys have more questions, put them in the comments. You're welcome, Monique. She says, thank you. Um, okay. Let's see. So you did talk about... Um, Parkinson.org movement and falls. That link is on the um, the website. Is that the Care Map link, or yes. is Care Map different? Okay, can so, you tell us a little bit about Care Map? So yes, Care Map was designed um, specifically with advanced Parkinson's in mind. So um, Care Map is care for managing advanced Parkinson's. That's what MAP stands for. So if you go to Parkinson.org/CareMap, it'll take you to a whole host of really fabulous caregiver information and resources. Um, so you'll find a lot of the information that we've discussed today. Um, and you'll find this really fabulous whole video series um, talking with experts and doing demos of practical ways um, to make sure that you are doing everything you can to care for your loved one with advanced Parkinson's. Um, so things like what I mentioned with movement and falls um, but some other ones that I wanted to bring up with you, we've got um, some videos on making comfortable schedules and organizing medical information. You can find all that at parkinson.org slash organization. Um, we also have videos on mealtime and swallowing um, strategies you can do to help, you know, make that a little easier. As we know, that can be one of the scariest parts of advanced Parkinson's. We've got videos on how to assist in the bathroom and um, on medications and other general health issues and dealing with issues around rest and sleep, um, strategies for when you're traveling or using transportation, all these different things. Um, and you can get to all of those through parkinson.org slash care map. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, they're amazing videos. I've checked out a lot of them. I've shared some of them with some of my clients and they're awesome, really awesome videos and resources. So make sure you guys check those out. Um, maybe just start with the ones that you're needing the most help with. Maybe mm -hmm. mealtime is the biggest struggle or maybe, you know, getting on and off the toilet is the biggest struggle. Um, you know, those types of things, search those things out first and then use it as a library as needed. Cause there's a lot 
in there for sure. You guys have done an awesome job. Yeah. And um, the other thing to keep in mind again, I know I keep plugging it, but the helpline is a great place to start. If you're having, if you go to parkinson.org slash care map and you're like, this is too much. I don't even know where to start. Um, which can happen. Um, it's a, we've got a very robust website, which is fabulous, but, um, especially folks who are not quite as tech savvy, I think can get a little lost anywhere that has, um, you know, lots and lots to it. Um, calling the helpline, they can help you find exactly what you're looking for. They can send you a direct link if you're on email, um, or they can mail, um, some of the different fact sheets or printouts to you if that's easier for you. Okay. And that number is on the screen now for those of you who want to write it down. Um, and again, we'll put all of this stuff in our care, caregiver kit, but that's an, a great phone number to call um, as soon as you need it. Okay, well, I am out of questions. Is there anything that you wanted to add, Annie, that we'd missed? Hmm, let me look at my notes. Um, oh, yes. Just real quickly, this is always a touchy subject, but I wanted to touch on it. Um, a lot, we hear a lot questions about how do we know if a care facility is needed? And it's something that a lot of people really want to avoid. It's something that a lot of caregivers promise their loved one that they would never do up until the point where they need it. Um, the first thing I would say is don't make that promise if you haven't already, um, because you just don't know what lays ahead. Um, but it's important to, um, really think about making sure that you're providing safe and effective care at all times. And if it, there comes a time where you are not physically or emotionally able to do that, that's when it's time to make that move. Um, and it's important to start making those evaluations and getting an idea of, you know, the, the where and the what you can afford and what you would be comfortable with before it becomes an issue. Um, it's a conversation I recommend having before you're suggesting it, um, as hard as those conversations are. Um, and I just wanted to point out to anyone who is, has dealt with that or is dealing with that or is thinking about, you know, oh, how would I ever do that? It's important to remember that the move to a care facility doesn't negate your role as a caregiver. You are still their caregiver. You are still their loved one. You still will do a lot of things for them. Um, but you don't, if it gets to a point where you can't provide that safe care 24 hours a day, then you've got to remember that that might be what's best. As hard as it may be for your loved one, as hard as it may be for you. Yeah, that's never an easy thing. Nobody's ever done that, you know, without some heaviness on their heart. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to ask you, Annie, Jay Benjamin posts, I'm going to put his comment up here on the screen so everyone can see. He says, it's very sad that not many nursing homes understand Parkinson's. I've spoken with so many people in support groups stating that, and some other people are kind of ch chiming in. Um, do you have any suggestions for if someone is, is in a facility that really doesn't understand Parkinson's or maybe isn't providing the best care, is there some educational materials that you guys offer to help? Um, I feel like I'm kind of leading because I feel like I know the answer, but what options do people who are in Jay's situation have for their loved ones who are already in a facility that maybe aren't getting the best care? So it is a really difficult thing. And I, I think if you give it 10 or 15 years, it'll be very different. I think you are going to see more and more places like the memory care units that exist for Alzheimer's, but for Parkinson's. Um, but as of, you know, this moment right here, right now, you're absolutely right, Jay, that a lot of them are not the best place for people with Parkinson's. Um, the, the simplest recommendation I have is to talk to your support groups and find out who has been where and who has had positive and negative experiences. Um, if you talk to someone who's been in the group a long time, they probably will know someone who was in the group before you who dealt with, you know, finding a nursing home for a loved one with Parkinson's who hopefully will have a positive recommendation. Um, if you're not able to do that, or if you've got a loved one who is in an assisted living facility or nursing home um, that isn't providing good care, I would A, um, have that person call the helpline and talk through um, any, if there are any local resources available. Maybe we have a chapter who might be able to come out and do some training um, or a center of excellence who can, you know, 
do a consult in some manner. Um, I would always recommend um, utilizing the resources we have through our Aware and Care initiative um, to help make sure that um, people are getting their medication on time because that's so important with Parkinson's and that's in the nursing home as well as in the hospital. Um, and, and so there's a lot of printouts and tear off sheets and a lot of educational pieces readily available, pre printable, but also mailable um, that can be used to help educate. I would say you can talk to um, nursing home staff about some of these same exact videos that I'm talking to you about that can be helpful for people who don't know Parkinson's who should, um, who are, you know, in the medical world. Um, but ultimately, if you have a loved one who is in a, a home that isn't getting the care that they need, don't forget that you can look at other options and potentially move them. Um, Cause if they're not in a safe situation, um, you know, that's a problem. The other um, piece that I would recommend considering, and um, I don't remember exactly how to get to it. So you may have to consult with, again, your area agency on aging. Um, but most places have um, an ombudsman program um, where you can lodge complaints um, and have people come in and try and facilitate changes in assisted living facilities and nursing homes. Um, and this is something that would absolutely fall under that domain. So they would be able to come in and assess, you know, whatever complaint that you have. Um, and then they work with the facility to try and get them to make those changes. And, um, and if they don't make changes to make sure that it's a safe place, then that will be reflected in their reviews. Mm -hmm. I just envisioned this, um, the next thing the Parkinson's Foundation does is kind of very similar to um, the allied healthcare training, but for long-term care facilities or, you know, nursing homes where you guys have that do you have that certification for nursing homes specifically, or is it just so we don't? Are... So, so the allied team training for Parkinson's is um, primarily attended by medical institutions, but we have had quite a few um, nursing home and assisted living facilities go through that training. So I'm really glad you brought that up. That's another thing. If um, you know if things are bad, and if you can convince um, the the staff to participate in this, it can have a huge impact. It's a I think it's a three day course. Um, they would travel as a team. They may go, you know, a few this year, a few next year, you know, and so on. Um, but they really learn everything that they need to know about treating people with Parkinson's and it's tailored by discipline. Um, so there's times during the alley team training for Parkinson's where everyone's together, but then there are breakouts where all of the movement disorder specialists and neurologists are together and the nurses are in another room and the physical therapists are over here and the social workers over there. Um, so that's another potential, um, potential way to get them educated. It is one that's going to cost them some money. Um, but if you can convince them to do it, it's absolutely one of the best things um, that can be done. And, and, you know, in Jay's case, it sounds like all of the facilities around town are getting, nobody is good at Parkinson's. So yes, it may be a little investment to go to the allied healthcare team training, but you could also then become the facility where, you know, everyone with Parkinson's knows they can trust this facility. And so it ends up being better for business because you're taking better care of your residents mm -hmm. and you have a better way to support the community. Um, you know, from a business standpoint, that makes a lot of sense too. I would yeah. Think. And we've seen that happen. We've seen um, in my time in the Ohio chapter, there were, there was one particular um, assisted living, uh, well, senior living facility that one day realized they just had a bunch of Parkinson's patients. And so they said, well, I guess we're treating a lot of Parkinson's patients. We better get the training and, and, you know, bring resources here. They ended up putting a lot of um, exercise classes specific to Parkinson's and, and they are finding that the more they invest in making it a safe and comfortable place for people with Parkinson's, the more people with Parkinson's they get as residents. Um, and obviously as, you know, a living facility, that's, that's a big deal. When people are happy, they tell their friends and they bring their friends, especially in the Parkinson's world, which is so connected. Yeah, I agree, I agree. So thank you, Jay, for starting that conversation and um, hopefully those were some helpful resources. So um, that is essentially 
a whole variety of ways that you can help support your loved one with advanced Parkinson's and also take care of yourself if you're a caregiver out there. Um, you know, whatever stage, maybe you're not quite um, to the point where you're taking care of someone with advanced Parkinson's, who knows what's coming down the line, but arming yourself with these tools early on, well before you even need them, is what's important and what's really so powerful. So if you found this video helpful, please give it a like, share it with someone in your support group, share it with, um, you know, anyone that you think may benefit from knowing about these resources early, even if it's well before, um, the later stages of Parkinson. So Annie, thank you so much for coming on again. Um, you guys can find, again, a link to all of these resources inside of our caregiver kit. Um, you know, make sure you go back, rewind this, take notes, but everything that she mentioned will be in that caregiver kit. So you can download it at invigoratept.com slash caregivers. And Annie, um, one last shout out for the Caregiver Summit that is coming yes, up. Yes, yes, December, December 1st. 1st. Um, look and see if there's a local program in your area. We'll be broadcasting live from Phoenix, Arizona to 17 satellite sites across the country. Um, and if there's not one near you, there may be a local viewing party or you can watch it from your home computer um, live or after the fact, it will be archived and available on DVD. Okay, and that's parkinson.org slash summit? Summit, yes. The focus summit. of that is collaborative care, ways to make sure you're caring for yourself while you care for your loved one with Parkinson's disease. Yes, so if you loved Annie as much as I did, as much as everyone watching did, um, and it's before December 1st, check that out, although it sounds like it will be on replay. So head over to parkinson.org slash summit um, and thank you so much, Annie, for everything that you do and everything that the Parkinson's Foundation does for our tribe. Well, I'm so welcome. Or you are so welcome. <laughs> yeah, I'm so welcome. <laughs> I'm so and you're welcome. so thanked. Yes. I'm so <laughs> okay. glad you had me on, and I hope that it was helpful for everyone. Yes, and we'll do it again in the future for sure. So thank you, everyone, for watching. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe, and then we'll be back soon to finish out our caregiver-focused video series next week with Nancy Hovey, who is a wonderful care partner um, and also a Davis Finney Foundation ambassador. So we'll see you next time for that one. All right. Bye, Annie. Bye.